to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ bless be the god and father of our lord jesus christ the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Welcome to our study of the book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is going to be defending his right to be an apostle and offering some various encouragements to the church at Corinth. Paul kind of summarizes the book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, when he says, We walk by faith, not by sight. Today in chapters 1 through 4, we're going to notice that Paul makes the encouragement, offers the principle that we walk by faith in the promises of God. How true it is that we serve a God who is loving and His promises are for us today just as much as they were for people in the first century. As Paul begins 2 Corinthians, we note who it is that he's writing to and who the church belongs to. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul says this, To the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in all Achaia. Here we learn that Paul is writing to the church. But notice especially the description, the ownership Paul places on the church. It is not the church of men. It is not the church of the most popular religious ideas. Paul notes that the church belongs to God. Friend, how important it is as we face the outset of this book and as we look at the religious world that is so divided around us that we understand God's church belongs to Him. It has no right to wear any man-made names or any ideas. In fact, it is the church of God belonging to Him. We notice in Romans 16, verse 16, Paul also says, The churches of Christ greet you. And so what was the church called in biblical times? It was the church that belonged to God. It is the church that belonged to Jesus Christ. It is the general assembly in, uh, of the firstborn, those whose names are registered in heaven. Hebrews 12, verse 28. Paul refers to it in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, when he says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of the living God, the temple of God, the house of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. It's God's house. It's, it's His place of worship today. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19, after Peter had made that, that great statement, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And he said, and I say to you that you're Peter, you're a small stone, but on this rock, on this bedrock foundation statement you've made, I'll build my church and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. Friend, as we think about the church of the Lord today, the church of God, let's understand that the ownership of it and the description titles it wears ought to give God the glory and the honor. And really, as Romans 16, 16 suggests, it is the church that also belongs to Jesus. And here's why. Who paid? Who paid the great price for the church today? Listen to the words of Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased 
with his own blood. Church of the Lord or Church of God, as some translations have, here we again see the idea that the church belongs to God. Jesus purchased the church with his own precious blood. He paid the price. He established it. He called it his own. Friends, there is but one church, Ephesians 4, verse 4, and how we need to understand at the outset of this book and truly in understanding the New Testament that God has one church and it belongs to him, not to any men today. But as Paul opens up the book, writing to Christians and writing to the church, he also begins to build upon the promises and the character of God. As we walk by faith, we walk by faith in the promises and the character of who God is. And notice the beautiful description of 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. The Apostle Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we, which we ourselves are comforted by God. As we think about God and His character, we know that God cannot change, Malachi 3 verse 6. We know that He doesn't lie, Titus 1 verse 2, Hebrews 6 verse 18. But here's another wonderful attribute of the God we serve. He is the Father of mercies. The idea of mercy is that of, of compassion, being tender and caring toward others. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tells us that is the nature of God. God's not slow concerning His promises, as some count slowness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is a long-suffering God. He is a merciful God, and He has made every avenue available for us to be His children, to live according to His will, and have the blessings of heaven. So He's a merciful God. But notice Paul also says, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. This word comfort is also used in the New Testament to describe the Holy Spirit. It's the same root word. John 14, 16, Jesus promised His disciples that He was about to depart, but He was going to send another, the Holy Spirit, the helper or comforter, to give them aid. The comforter brought the word. The comforter allowed them the ability to do miracles in the first century. He was a help in their time of need. And friends, that's the basic idea of our God. God is our help in time of need. We can trust Him like we can trust no other. We can say, the Lord is my helper. What shall man do to me? Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. But friend, as we face the outset of 2 Corinthians, we also need to understand that in this epistle, one of the promises, one of the things we can be sure of is that God has made every avenue possible for us not to remain in ignorance of His will, but to be informed about His promises. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. Paul here says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, as he readies these disciples to learn about God's will, he says, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia. And he goes on to tell them about the trouble that they faced. But that, that idea, we do not want you to be ignorant, friend, that is something that we can know has always been God's will. God does not want man to remain in ignorance. That's why He's revealed His will to him. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 11, Paul made this same encouragement to Christians in Ephesus, and notice how he worded it there. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, Paul says, We here, as he talks about their problems and what they're facing, he says, We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather you need to expose them. Well, how is it that Paul expected them to come out of darkness and expose error? God had given them knowledge that made it possible. Ephesians 5 verse 17, Paul said, Do not be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Friends, God has given us the Bible, His will, His word, so that we can know exactly what He wants us to do. Jesus said it this way in John 8 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth, shall make you free. Not only is it possible to know the truth, but look at the power that comes from knowing that. It can set us free from sin and give us the hope of heaven.
Friend, did you know that one of the reasons God wrote the Bible is so we wouldn't have to wonder and doubt and worry about our salvation? 1 John 5, verse 16, John says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Knowledge of God's will is what separates those who claim to be Christians from those who just have the facade of looking like and acting like what the world views as a Christian. Knowledge of God's will at times has been so imperative that without it, people were in jeopardy of being destroyed. Hosea 4 verse 6, Hosea said, God said through Hosea, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They didn't have the knowledge of God and what did He wanted them to do in their practical life. And as a result, they were going to go away and be destroyed. The same is so true for us today. If we are going to be the church that God wants us to, if we're going to be the people that God wants us to be, how important it is for us to know the Word of God. This is why Paul would say to Timothy, you need to study to show yourself approved unto God. This is why Paul would encourage the, the noble Bereans because they searched the Scriptures daily. Acts 17 verse 11. And in the long ago, this is why the proverb writer said, buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, verse 23. And so as we walk by faith, that faith is not a blind leap into the dark. We have faith in the promises of God based on the knowledge of His Word. You know, as we think about God and His Word, one of the great attributes that, of God that really ought to encourage us is His faithfulness. The God we serve is a God who is faithful, whose amens are yes and true and right in the sight of all men. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. Paul says this of God. He says, All the promises of God in Him, in Jesus, are yes and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. It's the idea that, that, that God's promises, all of those, are going to be right and true and that when God says something, you can rest assured that's the way it is. Hebrews 6 verse 18 says it's impossible for God to lie. Titus 1 verse 2 says we're living in hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie. It's an impossibility. It's something that God, His very nature, will not allow. Malachi 3 verse 6, God proclaimed, I am God, I change not. And thus, this ought to be of such encouragement to us. For when we read passages like 1 John 2, verse 25, this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. I don't have to worry. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to doubt. I can know God has said it. If I'll do His will, then everything will be okay. And so as we think about walking by faith in the promises of God, let's realize those promises are sure. Here's what you can know for sure, friend. Every time in Scripture that God has said something, He has always followed through with His will. When God told the people in the book of Joshua, in the book of Exodus and Joshua, as He was leading them up to the Canaan land, if you'll obey my will, if you'll obey my covenants, I'll give you this land flowing with milk and honey. When they did the will of God, God went right through with His promises as always. But when they failed to do God's will, there was a time of wandering in the wilderness of sin for those people. That's true for us today as we journey toward that place called heaven. God has made the promise that Jesus is the way, John 14, 6, the life and the truth. No man comes to the Father except by Him. If we will follow Jesus and do His will, you can know for sure that you'll be saved. As Paul notes in verse 21, it is true that Christians stand by faith. It is our faith in God in the midst of all the troubles and tribulation that keeps us going. We walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 15 verse 27. That faith is, again, not a leap into the dark. For whatever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10 verse 17. And friends, as we talk about standing by faith, that is such a powerful principle because of what we see in passages like 1 John 5 and verse 4. Listen to the words of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Notice what 
John says here. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. It's our faith in God that helps us to overcome the world. But now as Paul moves into chapter 2, building on those same promises of God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul made a very difficult item for the Corinthian Christians to follow. He laid down a very difficult principle, and that was there was a man there who was living with, with his father's wife. He had taken up residence with her. They were in a relationship together. Paul said, you need to put that ungodly brethren out from among you. You need to disfellowship him. You need to cleanse the church in so doing. It was difficult. It took some encouragement by Paul, but they followed through with that. They disfellowshiped that ungodly man. Well, what happened? Well, as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we all ought to rejoice in the promises of God because the church did exactly what God told them to do. They disfellowshipped that ungodly adulterer. They put him out of the congregation to save his soul and to purify the church. And look what happened in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 8. Notice what Paul is here writing to the church. He says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 8, concerning this same principle, this same man, who they had put away, Paul says, I urge you, reaffirm your love to him. What happened? Disfellowship worked. They put him out of the congregation. They followed the will of God. And now how wonderful it is that Paul is writing to them and saying, look, it worked. Don't make it too hard for him. You reaffirm your love to this man who's repented. And so, friend, regardless of what society thinks, regardless of what the media likes or doesn't like, regardless of what some in the church view to be too harsh, the Bible teaches that when we follow the will of God, it always works. And my friends, disfellowship always works. It works for one or if not more reasons. It works mainly because that's what God has told us to do to keep the church pure. We ought to be ashamed when we're not willing to put out ungodly people from among us, but rather, like 1 Corinthians 8, we think that we're puffed up and we can deal with it. How foolish of us. It works because God told us to. And as here, it's one of the only ways to restore some people who are so deep in sin that they're not willing to come out of it. And so how we need to have faith in the promises of God even concerning the difficult things. But you know, my friends, it's the case that Satan can use us, the Christian, as an unforgiving person, as a tool in his arsenal. In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11, as Paul is writing these Christians, telling them to reaffirm your faith in the midst of that, in the midst of their not being as forgiving as they ought to, he notes that if we're not what God wants us to be, if we're not forgiving and loving toward those who've repented, we're in Satan's arsenal and he can use us. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Paul says, Lest less Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan can use us as one of his tools or devices if we're not willing to wrap our arms around that person who's repented and do what's right. Thus, we need to realize the importance of forgiveness. Followers of God, according to the scripture, have always been led in victory when they do the will of God. My friends, here's the promise you can rest assured of today. If you'll do what God says, rest assured you will be victorious in the end. Listen to the words of 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. What a great shout of victory. The Bible says in verse 14, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph or victory in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. Christians are the victors in this life and especially in the life to come. You remember our victory is in our faith, 1 John 5 verse 4. Our victory can only be had because Jesus, through death, overcame him who had the power of death, Hebrews 2 verse 14. Our victory is made possible by the great sacrifice of Jesus. As John saw him approaching, John said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And our victory can be sure because we trust in the right source. Paul said this in Philippians 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Trust me, friend. The Bible says if you follow Christ, 
you will be victorious and you can trust the Bible and you can trust God's Word. If you go down the path of righteousness and do what God says, you will not be led astray. And in so doing, look at what we represent to God. As we walk the path of righteousness, as we head down the road to victory, look how pleasing we are in God's sight. Notice 2 Corinthians 2 verses 15 and 16. Look at this beautiful image. The Bible says, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the ones we are the aroma of death leading to death. To the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? We are the fragrance of Christ. We diffuse the, that fragrance wherever we go. It is a sweet smelling savor to the Lord as Christians live the life they ought to. And look, to some, we're the fragrance of death leading to death. Their, their life is not being lived like they ought to. And our life shows them that. But to others, of life leading to life. Friend, if we are the fragrance of Christ, then I ask you this. How do you smell? How do you represent Christ? If the Christian is the fragrance of what Christ ought to be like, if that is how Christ ought to look, how he ought to appeal to others, just as a nice smelling cologne or perfume is appealing, if our life is a representation of Christ in that sense, how do we smell to others about Christ? Do we really give off that good aroma? Does our life, show by our actions, by our words, by our speech, by all that we do, that others ought to want and join this life. You see, in Matthew 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We need to make sure that we put off that good fragrance because 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3 says, We may be the only Bible that some people ever read. Friend, have you ever thought about that? You in your life may be the only Bible some people ever read. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3. Look at what Paul here says. Paul says, verse 3, Clearly you are an epistle, a letter of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. Notice, you are an epistle or in a letter of Christ. As people read your life, it's like a living letter. What does your life say in that letter? Are you living According to the will of God, as people of the world view you, could they say, that man is trying to live according to the Bible. His, he's an honest, he's a trustworthy man, he's, seen, he's someone who's trying to do right, and he's someone whom we can trust. As Paul makes this point about the epistle of Christ, he knows that in the back of some of these people's mind, there is still that lingering wonder, well, why not the epistle of Moses? Why, why are we under the law of Christ and not the law of Moses? Or are we really? And so in the much, of, much of the rest of chapter 3, Paul transitions and shows that we are following the law of Christ and it is much better than the law of Moses. Notice some of these characteristics. In this text, he'll say, we're following the Spirit, the words of the Spirit of God, not the letter. The Spirit, it gives life, the letter kills. We're under the ministry of the Spirit. The old law was the ministry of death. It's written in our hearts. The other was written on stones. And you remember, those stones were broke at times. This law that we follow is more glorious, although the other itself was glorious. Its glory is never going to fade, and while the old law from its inception was fading, it is called the ministry of righteousness. The other is the ministry of condemnation. It is an open and unveiled law that gives hope, but Moses himself blinds people. 2 Corinthians 3 says it was a veiled law that had no clear hope. But Christ reveals true hope. In view of this section of 2 Corinthians 3 where he contrasts the beauty, the splendor, the greatness of the new law, why would anybody want to go back to the old law? And so as we talk about walking by faith in the promises of God, let's realize those promises are found in the New Testament. Now friend, here's the power that we have. To accomplish all the promises that God has given us, we have a power that is not in and of ourselves. Notice the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. 
The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side yet not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. How is it that in the midst of a, an evil sinful world, in the midst of difficulty and sin and temptation, we can follow and hold on to the promises of God? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Well, what's the treasure? The excellency of the power is not of us. Friend, I don't have to pretend that I can stand here and do it alone. I acknowledge, and all of us must, that we can't do it by ourselves. But here's what we can also acknowledge. We can and we must do it with God's help. Philippians 4 verse 13, you remember Paul said, I can do all things how? Through Christ who strengthens me. If we try to stand alone and do it by ourselves, we're destined to fall. We've got to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. But now friends, as we focus on the latter part of 2 Corinthians 4, here's what I also want you to know. The motivation for doing that is based on the fact that we have a better home promise for us. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What is it that, that really motivates and challenges me to hold on to the promises of God? Friend, it's the hope and the joy of heaven. If I live faithful to these promises, one day I can have a home in heaven with God. Friend, are you walking by faith in the promises of God? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you believed in Jesus? Are you willing to repent of your sins? Have you confessed the good name? Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. And have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? Acts 2 verse 38. If not, you need to do that so you can grab hold of the promises of God. And friend, let's all be encouraged to walk by faith in the promises of God, knowing that God can't lie and that we don't have to do it alone. May God help you as you strive to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the gospel of Christ.